Okay, hi and welcome to, <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> Love the audience. We've got a great audience tonight. Uh, they're so helpful. I'm Bjorn Garnvik and I'm from Soft House. And it's our privilege to sort of help out and sponsor a night about open source. Now, I want to give you like an anecdote. What does it mean to, you know, do open source today? Is it, you know, hunkadori? Because, you know, open source is the backbone of what we do nowadays. It's like the skeleton. We reuse and we refactor and we rehone and whatnot. But it's there. It's the platform that we all depend on. So, you know, imagine my surprise. I was at this company a medium-sized company, uh, you know, hundreds of, of employees, and uh, this uh, management, I'm not going to name names here, no company, you know, no company present. Um, and, and, and I was talking about open source, and I said, like, yeah, great, you know, do it, li li you know, apply it liberally. And, and, you know, one of the managers said, and stopped me and said, do we use open source? But this is an IT company, and this is the, the kind of top level. I go, I couldn't keep my face straight. I said, yeah, but then just kept going. So it's not, you know, it's not self-evident to everyone that we're using it. And I think you know this. We use open source. We can't depend, you know, we can't do stuff without it. So it's everywhere. It's in our DNA nowadays. So tonight we're going to see different perspectives of what it means to do open source, uh, both from the sort of uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to save the world doing the open source to I'm a corporate programmer and I want to do open source. How can we do, do that? To security and to the Darth Vader company that said we hate open source. So we got it all here tonight. Uh, yeah, Tib Tibby is smiling, but you know, <laughs> I'll get to you shortly. Okay, um, so it's a bit beyond, uh, but the next speaker. Um, Application Innovation Lead at Microsoft. And you've done an international career as a developer, as an MVP. Now that's, you know, if you talk to my kids, it's like saying most valuable player. <laughs> so I, that, that's correct, right? Yes. Professional, for those who don't know. And also CTO, so you've got one of those bunch of acronyms. And I know you're going, to, you're from Microsoft, you represent Microsoft. And, you know, and I know the title of, you know, uh, uh, you. It talks about uh, open source. So please give TB a, a, a hand. Yeah. So. Now, I know the quote was from uh, uh, Balmer, Steve Balmer, and he, he also used another C word. Uh, I think it was communist. Yeah. Uh, so that kind of is a bit of a hard start. But nowadays, he confesses to loving Linux, and even Nadella uh, mm -hmm. says that. So. Was it always like this for you personally? I mean, w were you always open source, or do you did you transcend at uh, some point? Well, that's actually a fair question. I started to use the, the, the very first, uh, yeah, one I would say was uh, and Hibernate, that I was that was really the you know the, the really uh, the first one that was in the .NET ecosystem. Now, if I go a little bit farther back, I was actually working for J Rocket, and J Rocket was in Java space, and Java in theory was mm. open is open source and J Rocket was using their specifications. Cool, we've got more to talk about. <laughs> I hear this. Yeah, so uh, has anyone so used Hibernate here? Or N Hibernate. Okay. <laughs> who who well in my case it was Hibernate. <laughs> yeah. Uh who loves to hate it? <laughs> Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay, yeah, yeah, okay, so yeah. we got to talk later. Uh, pizza, <laughs> yes. I had Stockholm syndrome on that one. Uh, <laughs> so um, <laughs> yes. So thank you, and the stage is all yours. Thank you. So I didn't update you actually on that, uh, the because I'm not working for Microsoft anymore. It doesn't mean that I hate them or, or anything, but I am a Microsoft fanboy. I even put it in here, you know. So uh, I use I, I started to work with Microsoft Technologies back in '94, and I really, you know, I, I I really grew up with it. And even when I did Java and J Rocket, I was actually still secretly loving, you know, Microsoft and wanting to, you know, longing to get back. So I was thinking, you know, talking about Microsoft and Microsoft, uh, you know, and uh, re the relation to, to open source. And I know we say everywhere, or we used, when I was working there, we used to say everywhere, Microsoft loves open source. I have a bunch of t-shirts and every single one of them has the Microsoft loves open source here on the side. 
And I know a lot of people think this is a marketing slogan, you know, because, yeah, back to Balmer, he was always there, you know, he, he famously said that, you know, they embrace and destroy, like, let's embrace Linux and then destroy it from within. I don't know if they really managed to do that. I think it happened the other way around. So in order to make it interesting, I think about, you know, to talk about it from a historical standpoint. So it all started in 76. Actually, Microsoft started in 75, but in 76, I think, Bill Gates got very desperate because they were doing a lot of work, you know, they are spending a lot of time, and then the software piracy was very big, you know, like instead of selling a lot of copies of their basic interpreter for Altari, people were distributing it, you know, like they were punched cards, or actually punched tapes that they were distributing around them, and they wouldn't pay the $25 or $30 license to get the, to get the software itself. So he wrote a you know, famous late letter, you can find it, you know, online that where he complains about that and said you wouldn't go to a doctor and not pay for that. You wouldn't go to, you know, you, you wouldn't go and get the book without paying the author or you wouldn't go listen to music without paying the, you know, paying the, the singer or the, the uh, you know, the person that, that made the, the song and so on. So he really wanted people to think about it and make sure that they understand that this is something that you might end up um, wanting to pay for that. And of course, um, he had other other things that happened, and th I think that when you know when you can say Microsoft started to have a not a very nice attitude towards open source, and not really, I, I wouldn't say that that stopped, you know that that was the only uh, the only thing that happened. Anyway, if we move a little bit fast forward, like 20 years, and even more than that, in 1996 Java came out, and Java was you know there was the idea was that this should be an open source thing, and that was a platform independent, and then Microsoft realized that they are losing actually the game. And they needed something more. It was C++, and I don't know how many of you did C++ back then, but yeah, so you remember the books. It was always the specification and then Microsoft specific. Specification and the standard and then Microsoft specific for pages. So they wanted to do something like a standard, and even they started not really open source, but they decided they wanted to do .NET. So they opened the CLI. The specification was actually open to everyone to take it and implement the way they wanted. The code itself was something that they were paying developers to do it and they were doing internally. So, of course, they said, we want to do .NET Framework, and this should be a platform independent, this should be language independent, not really open source. Again, they had a rotor that was the, the open source kind of, you know, helping people out there and give them access to code in acad academic uh, purposes. But .NET Framework fell short to one single point. When it came to platform independence, it was as long as it's Win32. So if it was Windows, then you could run .NET. So that's what they, that's what they did. So .NET Framework was the, you know, was the start of it. And then, of course, a year later, Balmer famously said, you know, Linux is a cancer. Actually, he never said Linux is a cancer. He said Linux is, is a malignant cancer, but he was not referring to the operating system itself, he was referring to the GPL, to the licensing model, because it was so, um, you know, like <laughs> like a pandemic. If you touch it, then you, you're done. You have to publish everything you do in a GPL mode. So that was a very bad proposition for a lot of enterprises. So he was just, you know, sounding out what everyone else was thinking in the enterprise world. So I don't think he was alone in doing that. And to be honest, if you look about 10 years ago, no enterprise out there would willingly go to do any open source. I mean, they would, if you want to adopt any open source technology, you'd have to go through a lot of hoops, you'd have to go through, speak with legals and so on. But of course, a lot of things were happening and .NET started to be more and more accepted by the enterprise and then there were a lot of things coming out like the N Hibernate, you know, so there was one of the product that was out there and Microsoft was always trying to create their own product and a lot of people became very upset with Microsoft and said, why do you have to reinvent the wheel? Why don't you help the ones that are already there and contribute to those? So that's why when Microsoft start to look around and try to understand, okay, so what are we doing here? So they contacted a couple of people. So to the right, it's Scott Gottlieb. He was still working for Microsoft. At the uh, he's still working, actually, right now, but he was working for Microsoft at that time. And he was looking at the things out there and what was actually making waves. And they saw Ruby on Rails and they saw the ease of use and all the tenants that they had in there and how that works. And Gottlieb decided we want to do MVC and we want to, you know, engage those guys because they were very vocal 
in the industry about open source and they were working a lot with, with Microsoft technologies and they wanted actually something better for Microsoft. So Rob Canary, Scott Hanselman and Phil Huck, all, all three of them were working actually. So they started to work for Microsoft and Microsoft created what was known to become MVC. So MVC Model View Controller, purely inspired from Ruby on Rails and done mostly, I would say, out of fear from you know losing a lot of developers, of web developers to other, you know, to other languages and other platforms, but was still something that Microsoft started to do. And that was the start of open source. That's when they started to actually be more and more open. It was in 2010 that Microsoft, for the very first time, uh, released Visual Studio with jQuery included. So there was a copy of jQuery or an official copy of jQuery included. And jQuery was, and it is still today, an open source library for JavaScript developers. So again, Microsoft was trying to do that more and more. I was in, in Redmond in 2012, and I got a chance to see the very first bits of .NET Core that got released four years later in 2016. But I saw actually Fowler and, and Damian Edwards on, uh, on stage Dem demoing those kind of, the very first bits of, of, of .NET Core. And don't believe that they done that because they really thought, oh, they can change the world. I think they wanted to do that because Azure needed that badly. badly. You needed some, you know, some uh, uh, framework or something to run your code that is very performant. And .NET framework was not that. There was another aspect of it. But Fowler and Edwards, they were very, Pro open source. They were actually re they released uh, SignalR a couple of years, you know, before that. So they were really talking about uh, open source, and they were really wanting to uh, have open source within Microsoft. So when they start looking at .NET Core, they said, "We want to do that, but we want to do it in an open source fashion." Actually, not even today. I don't. I wouldn't say .NET Core is an open source. Um, <laughs> platform, it's a source opened one, so you can see all the code, you can see all the things, all the, uh, all the projects and all the planning, it's happening actually um, out in the open, so you can participate into those if you want to, uh, you can give your input and Microsoft usually listens. They accept PRs, but quite, you know, quite limited ones and mostly from people that they really trust and know. So they don't make it a big, you know, big fuss out of it that, oh, yeah, yeah, the .NET Core, everybody can, can contribute. They still have the ownership of that. And if we move forward a little bit longer in 2018, Microsoft acquired GitHub. And I think, you know, if you think, Microsoft already invested a lot of money in creating something called CodePlex because there was something else called SourceForge, which was full of crap and a lot of, you know, a lot of bugs and a lot of uh, spyware and malware on that side. So Microsoft wanted to create something. The very first project that was published to CodePlex was actually MVC. So they put it there as an open source so people can, can see the code, can work with that, and they publish all other things on CodePlex. And until 2017, that was, you know, that was the place to be. But then Microsoft realized that it actually doesn't make any sense to, 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 to maintain that because GitHub was a very good platform and they were using, they were actually Microsoft back in 2016 already was the biggest contributor, you know, um, of code in GitHub. Not, not hel helping others, but based on the number of projects that they had already in GitHub, they were one of the biggest, the biggest users of GitHub. So for them made a lot of sense. For GitHub made as well a lot of sense because they were, you know, in a in a tough place. They couldn't really capitalize the things that were happening in there. So that's when they decided to actually move on and and buy GitHub and still offer it for for free for all those uh, things. I think it even added a lot of features for you know for the open source contributors and for the people working with that. Which is again, I think it's a very good. Uh, it was a very good move from Microsoft side. So. Where are we today? There are a lot of projects that are actually uh, that are actually using open source. Linux, for instance, <laughs> it's the most used operating system on Azure. It's not Windows, you know. Co contrary to all the beliefs, we have Visual Studio Code, which again is open source. We have GitHub. We have TypeScript, which is an open source language. We have Kubernetes, or at least the creator of Kubernetes works for Microsoft and still contributes a lot to that. Uh, RxJS, it's a, as well a product that came first from Microsoft, and now it's quite popular in the Java, uh, you know, in the JavaScript uh, uh, world, and many more. Like they are very popular in, uh, with Chromium and so on. If you want to listen to the whole history, 
my friend Richard Campbell has a whole hour of that. He actually goes into more details and more anecdotes. He knows all the people at Microsoft. He even has interviews with more, m most of them that you can listen to. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's me. Let's see, next person. Thank you. Thank you, TB. Okay, the next speaker is, um, he's one of those classical OS developers, you know, uh, sit late at nights, weekends, I'm making a fair guess here, because given the number of lines of code he has out there and frameworks, I would say you've done your fair share of doing that. Now, uh, also, and perhaps most importantly, uh, Johan Holleby is a former colleague. You know, I kind of think that matters. Uh, somehow, somewhere. <laughs> anyway, um, now given all those time and hours, and I, I'm guessing you're doing many of them at night, what motivates you? Or are you going to get into that in the, in the, yeah. in the session? Yeah, I'm going to get into that in the session. Okay, so <laughs> let's, not, let's not delay any further. Uh, please, the stage is yours, Yuval. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so uh, today we're going to talk about uh, open source and why I do open source. That's uh, pretty interesting for me, because usually I'm here talking about my different open source projects, but I've never <laughs> spoken about my experience uh, creating them, so that's, uh, that's new to me. Oh. Uh, I have a, an agenda. Uh, I will just show up some of my open source projects and yeah, talk about what, uh, what uh, Bjorn was uh, alluding to, uh, why I got into open source, and why I'm doing open source. That was pretty good. Uh, you know, pretty good to have this kind of reflection for myself. I mean, why am I doing this? Um, yeah, and then some what I should be doing more of, and uh, yeah, and what I wish people uh, people think a little bit about when they interact with uh, with open source uh, communities. And um, yeah, I have founded uh, quite a few open source projects. Uh, the most uh, famous one is probably this one. Uh, rest assured. Um, and I just checked, the, or just like a couple of months ago, I checked the download statistics, and I was quite shocked that this was like downloaded two and a half million times every month. And uh, this thing here was not far behind. And then uh, this one has like uh, 1.2 million downloads a month or something. So they're actually quite, uh, I, I didn't actually know that <laughs> they were <laughs> downloaded that much. So that was uh, interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, so. You know, my journey into open source actually started on, on, a, on a plane. Um, and back then, I started working at this uh, consultancy here in Malmö, J-Way, where I met uh, Björn as well. And um, I had the opportunity to work with some really knowledgeable uh, uh, colleagues that were, some of, these, some of them were, were also into uh, to open source. And I got really inspired. You know, I, I was kind of, you know, just looking for for problems where I could make a contribution. And uh, you know, we, then we were at, at this competence development uh, uh, trip uh, in Lisbon. And on the plane back, a colleague of mine started experimenting uh, with, uh, with mocking static methods in Java using something called Aspect J. And this was something like people were even talking back then at, in conferences. They, t they, they told us that, oh, you shouldn't use static methods because uh, you cannot test them. And what they meant was that you cannot mock them. And when we found a way to actually do that, then we said, oh, then these you know, arguments doesn't hold any, any longer. So we started to you know, see if we can make something out of this. And uh, you know, out of that grew this uh, um, framework called the PowerMock. That uh, was my first uh, open source uh, project. And it was very interesting because it was quite advanced. We were using like bytecode manipulation and custom class loading and agents and stuff to do all these things that you normally shouldn't be able to do in, in the language, like mocking static methods and mocking calls to new and all this kind of stuff. Uh, so it was a lot of, of uh, black magic going on here. And uh, yeah, th this has led to you know power mock. I mean, with this framework, you could do a lot of things that shouldn't be possible. <laughs> That's what he said. Uh, but uh, people then, you know, found an excuse to, I mean, you could test any code, however bad it was. So people started, you know, testing their really uh, crappy production code. And then the tests obviously would reflect that as well. So now you have bad production code and bad test code that was, imp that is impossible to maintain. So, you know, PowerMock over the years has become some kind of a 
punch ball and I just search for some uh, some comments uh, it's still very popular and I mean there are legitimate uh, cases for using it but uh, but especially like this one here so if I had a time machine okay he would go back in time he would kill Hitler he would tell someone called John Podosta that it's illegitimate I don't have no idea who that is but then the third thing is the one to prevent power mock from ever being created I mean imagine all the things you can do with a time machine we can, you can watch how the pyramids got built and if Jesus was resurrected from the dead, but no, they want to prevent power mock from ever being created. Yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting. Um, but yeah, the, the other <laughs> two of the mo my most uh, um, yeah, uh, downloaded products are Vestershire and Avatildi. And they also started with, like, I had a problem at work and uh, I thought that, hmm, this should be easier to do. In the case of Rest Assured, it was like uh, I wanted to test uh, HTTP-based uh, uh, services, and I just thought that it was so cumbersome to do in, in Java at the time. Uh, so I created this, and also how utility it was uh, some, something similar. And uh, I mean, the cool thing with, with all of these projects is that you get the opportunity to go to a lot of conferences, or at least uh, I, I, I had that opportunity in, at uh, JWay. Uh, which was real nice. So I traveled, you know, to a lot of uh, different countries and uh, held uh, uh, talks and met a lot of people. It was very, a very interesting experience as well. And, and here I went to a really big conference uh, uh, called DevOx. And I mean, you are so small with this big screen and there are like a uh, gazillion people looking at you and you are scared as, uh, I don't know. But uh, it was an interesting experience. Um, yeah, this is my latest open source project, a current. I was uh, here last year talking about this. This is an event sourcing library. And this, uh, I had an idea uh, for this uh, library. Uh, I've been interested in, in event sourcing for many, many years. And I thought that uh, maybe I can do something, you know, simpler than everything else that is out there. Because I thought it was, uh, the existing solutions were, were too complex, in my opinion. and. Uh, I, I wanted to, uh, the, the framework shouldn't, uh, you know, force me to write code in a certain way. I wanted to be able to write my code in any way I like, and then use uh, this uh, library. And um, yeah, so uh, I have an, an ex-colleague that I talked to uh, from uh, time to time, and we had this, like, each, we were challenging each other, so I just felt that oh, I, I have to, to write something. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> I. I have to make it open source, and I have to, you know, write all the documentation and all the things. Otherwise, I'm not uh, settled. So this is how uh, my latest project got started. Um, but yeah, there is some downsides <laughs> as well of doing open source. And uh, once you release something as open source, people expect things. Uh, so you want you need to do maintenance, and people complain if a feature is not ready. Uh, if, uh, why, why isn't this bug fixed and why I'm to update the documentation and so on and so forth. And like in PowerMock's case, I mean, I have my custom JVM. Why doesn't that work on this particular minor version of Mokito? Like you should go and uh, fix this. Yeah. And then there are like, you have to write documentation. So this is uh, some documentation for, uh, for a current. And I wrote this last summer. I actually went up at 6 a.m., two hours before uh, the rest of my family that for the entire uh, my entire vacation to write this uh, documentation here so that's uh, pretty insane now that I <laughs> reflect on it <laughs> so I mean this is the question I mean why do I do open source I mean, of all the things I could do I mean it sounds horrible <laughs> no, I don't know I mean I honestly don't know why do I do this I just feel the need to contribute and I uh, think it's fun in the beginning but then, like, uh, if you have to maintain your product for, like, 12 years, in the case with PowerMock, then it's kind of, I don't know. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not always fun. But, yeah. Then, of course, I mean, you can build your name and a CV. I mean, personally, I don't care that much about that. But uh, it is a, it's, it's not a bad thing, I suppose. Uh, explore IDs. That's uh, really good. I mean, sometimes you have IDs in your head. But, it's in, you know, when you need to do something, and you, you write it down then you see if it works. So that's uh, one thing as well. And yeah, I do love when people say nice things about the progress I've created. Uh, that's, that's good. <laughs> and um, also another thing that keeps me doing open source is competitors. 
maybe, you know, in, so in the case of rest assured, I was quite early, but then, you know, competitors, uh, you know, started to arrive, and then I, you know, I have to hack, uh, hack away and do, you know, more features and change stuff so that uh, people will still, uh, still be using it. And yeah, I can skip that. Yeah, and then, you know, speak at conferences and uh, food cafe. I mean, I've, I think I've spoken nearly every year uh, since the uh, inception of Food Cafe, actually. At least once every year. And I, uh, my intention is to <laughs> keep on doing that. So I need to spawn more uh, open source projects, I think. <laughs> um, what I probably should do is invest more time in community building. Because, you know, I want things out. I'm more interested in, in the technical things and not <laughs> that much about community. But it would be great to have more, uh, more people involved uh, I mean, I do get a lot of pull requests, but that's uh, that can also be quite demanding. You have to uh, like check the, you know, review all the pull requests and stuff, and have a lot of discussions in mailing lists. So better developer uh, documentation um, would be uh, a good thing as well, so that other people could get into. But but then it's more documentation. I mean, I want to write code. So um, yeah. And um, yeah, what I uh, what I wish people would think uh, think about is that you know, some projects are completely voluntary by individuals. And uh, this is the case uh, by, uh, for, for my projects. And uh, you shouldn't expect too much for every open source project that you, uh, that you use. And uh, please help out. And you know, just be a nice person. I mean, you don't have to write uh, bad stuff uh, or negative comments uh, all over the place. It can bring you down. I mean, personally, I don't uh, really care that much, but uh, it's... Uh, it's uh, nicer to read uh, good comments or nice comments about your products, uh, obviously. Um, yeah, and then uh, you should <laughs> try to find a good employer. So, I mean, Parkster, they sponsor uh, these projects. Uh, like, if I have something that I, I want to do, it's, uh, you know, I can uh, work on these projects uh, on, uh, you know, paid uh, time, which is awesome. So yes, today uh, we discovered a bug, actually, in, uh, in Rest Assured, so I've spent, uh, more than two hours, and I'm really frustrated because I still haven't solved it. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's really hard to, to find, you know, times in the evenings and mornings and stuff um, when you have all these uh, projects. Uh, yeah, so summary for me, open source can be both uh, fun and very demanding. Uh, there are lots of opportunities. I mean, you learn a lot when you have to, you know, get your ideas down in, into actual code. And it's also really fun when people start using your project. Um, but maybe this is a note to myself. I should probably be much better at building a, a community and try to, you know, bring people in. Uh, then, I, so I don't have to do everything uh, myself. And it's not like I, I don't do everything myself, but I do quite a lot <laughs> um, by myself. And uh, yeah, that can be quite uh, demanding. Okay, thanks a lot for uh, for listening. <laughs> thanks, you. Um. Our next speaker is uh, Alexander Ola uh, from a company uh, that, you know, can you help me out here? Uh, you gave me a sneak, sneak. Okay, there you go. So don't say anything else. Uh, now you got quite the background. I mean, uh, you like from programmer to uh, uh, community servers and, and the mastery in, in community. And I have to read here. Voluntary and community studies. Okay. Yeah, that's some quite research. a background. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm impressed. What are you most proud of? Hmm. If you look back at your CV and LinkedIn, and uh, yeah, feel free to do it. It's impressive. I think there's something good about every experience. Uh, the community building was really good, but I think you can experience that as well in, in the tech sector. So maybe that's uh, something that I'm only getting into. Okay, in so we're going to have a sleep in later tonight, just <laughs> as you know, you know to be, be pre prepared. Um, so uh, I've got a question here, uh, two questions. Uh, um, open source is used everywhere, uh, seriously. Um, but if we have a bug in it, isn't that a case against open source? Because if it was all proprietary, the bug would not be reproduced along thousands and thousands of servers. So have you ever thought about it that roundabout way of, of you know, it's so successful, that's a drawback? But we also have that thousand eyes principle, or how many, uh, however many eyes where so many people see the code, there's always someone who helps out and uh, submits a fix, right? Okay, good. Yeah, well, I like that argument, but uh, uh, for the sake of it, I wanted to make the other dark side argument. Thank you. Please give Ulla a hand. Thank you.
Hello everybody. Thank you for the introduction and thank you to Foo Cafe and Soft House for organizing this event and bringing the open source community together. It's very nice to be here. I'm always on the other side. Um, so I decided that uh, in the last months I've learned quite a lot and I wanted to share with you in the spirit of Foo Cafe and sharing with other people. Um, I, as Bjorn said, I work for Sneak. Uh, Sneak stands for So Now You Know. Uh, we're a cybersecurity company. Um, my team works specifically in the Java ecosystem. Uh, we uh, scan open source dependencies and projects uh, and we look for vul vulnerabilities and we suggest fixes. So today I would like to tell you about my personal journey to security, a slightly embarrassing one. I wish I could tell you it was someone else, but it was me. <laughs> uh, and I'll also tell you about a couple of recent prominent security incidents in open source. Um, I'll bring up some uh, numbers from uh, the recent State of Open Source Security Report. Uh, and I'll give you some tips on how to improve uh, your and your organization's um, security posture. So to start with my own experience, uh, I started coding about four years ago and um, my background is in environmental science. Uh, that's one of, the <laughs> one of the things that is my background. Uh, but I really wanted to develop uh, applications for scientists and automate some processes. So the first application that I worked on was um, meant to uh, analyze freely available satellite imagery for uh, changes in vegetation. And that was quite a difficult task for me. Uh, so I was very proud when I finally accomplished it. I uploaded the code to GitHub and uh, I started getting lots of notifications from Dependabot telling me that there are threats in my dependencies. And that really scared me because I didn't know what to do about it and security was not my background and not anything that I thought about. And a couple of, uh, well, what I did then was really I swept the problem under the carpet and I just uh, switched off the notifications. And a couple of years later, I worked on uh, another application that was uh, for volunteers to enter um, environmental observations uh, on a map and uh, into some surveys. And I was really focused on the features that I was adding to this application. Uh, after a few months, when I was sort of ready, I asked some volunteers uh, to test it before Christmas. And I still remember when after a couple of days I got an email from one of the volunteers saying, uh, talking about his newly acquired hacking skills and how he discovered that the application was vulnerable to cross-site scripting attacks. And again, I got really scared. Uh, and that was a Christmas holiday ruined. I spent a few days trying to figure out how to fix that. Uh, so yeah, that's my, that's my experience of security. Um, and then I realized that it's not just me and my small projects and my little bubble, um, but it's also a lot of big organizations that, that struggle with the same issues. And if you're a Java developer, and otherwise as well, uh, you might have heard about uh, the Log4J shell incident from last December. Um, that was a zero-day vulnerability discovered in a Java logging fr framework, a very popular one, um, Log4J. And at that time, it was estimated that about 8% of the most popular, the biggest uh, Java uh, package repository, Maven Central, was affected. So again, I saw that. Uh, not much experience of security, but I thought uh, my application, the application that I had worked on at that time was Groovy on Grails, which is in the Java ecosystem. I thought I should check if I'm affected by, um, by this. And I uh, searched for Log4j uh, in my code base, didn't find it, so I thought I'm safe. Uh, but then later, I know, I, I learned about uh, transitive dependencies, so the dependencies that are brought by the dependencies that you're using that you actually see in your project. And I learned that 60% of in instances of this specific vulnerability were found in transitive dependencies, so the ones that you uh, wouldn't see in your manifest files. Uh, another interesting thing about that incident was that 79 of the projects affected by Log4j had the vulnerability more than once on many transitive lines. And what that brought home to me was that uh, your code is only a tiny fraction of, or of the application that you own. 
um, it's estimated that 80 to 90 percent of code base is open source. And I also thought it's a little bit like cake. Like we all like getting it for free, and we, uh, we all like it, but it's really layered, and you never know exactly what is in which layer. Uh, you're getting all this uh, code from third parties, from the internet, um, um, and you don't always know what you're getting. Uh, and 80% of vulnerabilities are found in those indirect dependencies that you don't write into your manifest files. And it's not only just uh, malicious actors that might want to exploit your application or might introduce some uh, malicious code. Uh, this year we've seen a couple of incidents with protestware, um, and it was open source maintainers who actually uh, modified their code in uh, political protest or expressing their personal opinions. Um, there are a couple of uh, more loud ones, the ones that you might have heard about, was uh, Node IPC, uh, where the maintainer uh, added a dependency that printed um, a, a message against the war in Ukraine uh, in developers' machines. Yep. And this is this interesting thing of how much you can expect uh, from people who develop open source, like you mentioned. Um, it's someone's code, how much right do they have to modify it entirely? Open source is based on trust, um, so that's an interesting question. Uh, this year, um, the Linux Foundation, uh, in cooperation with Sneak, released a report on the state of open source security. This was a few months ago. Uh, they surveyed 550 um, open source developers, security professionals, uh, maintainer, open source maintainers, and so on. Uh, and we also used data from 1.3 billion uh, open source projects scanned by Sneak. And a few interesting things that came up in that report uh, were that about 70 percent, um, uh, sub uh, sorry, an average product, uh, project has about 70 dependencies. And that's uh, dependent on the ecosystem. There are a lot of dependencies, for example, in uh, JavaScript projects, a bit more than in other languages. Um, another interesting thing was, of those uh, dependencies, five had critical vulnerabilities in a project. And yet, 49% of organizations have an open source uh, a security policy. So only about half. Uh, know what to do if there's an incident or have a plan. And those organizations are quite unlikely to uh, have trust and be confident in the security of their dependencies and uh, indirect dependencies that they are using. There was also a question of who is responsible for your open source software uh, dependency security. And interestingly, 25% of respondents said that it's either open source maintainers or nobody who is responsible for their security, which I found also is very interesting. How much can you expect from open source maintainers? And this is, of course, not to say uh, don't use open source. Uh, going back to your question, Vern, <laughs> um, I think open source is great. I really agree with the ethos. And uh, it's just to say that we should enjoy it responsibly. And I've got a few tips for you or your organizations what to do. Um, automate, that's easy enough to do. There are some, uh, there's free tier uh, tools uh, that do that for you. Cut out the human factor, save time of your developers and uh, just automate the process. Use tools like software component analysis that scan your dependencies and static analysis, security testing that checks your code base, the code that you're writing. That's just some examples. Know your dependencies. Um, be up to date, uh, upgrade your dependencies when new versions become available, and don't put off issues because they only grow. Um, also, when you're using a package, check the help score of the package. Uh, there are a lot of free websites that give you that information. And if a package isn't healthy, if it's not maintained, or if it doesn't have a healthy community, just find an alternative. 
If you're an organization, appoint a security champion. It will be a person who will take the ownership of security in your team, and they can teach other people about what they learn. Also, if you're an organization, have an open source uh, policy. It can be just a one-liner where you decide that you won't have any um, high severity vulnerabilities in your production code. And this will give you some confidence that you know what to do if, uh, if any risk arises. Use software bill of materials. Uh, that's also quite, um, there's been quite a lot of talk about it recently. It's a document that will help you to, that will be like a list of ingredients in your app that will inform uh, both you and other people who want to use your software on what your software contains. And it will give you more control over your dependencies as well. And lastly, very importantly, support open source maintainers because you're using these people's free work. Um, so it's worth allocating resources to support open source projects that you're using. And I'd like to leave you with a few questions. What open source dependencies do you use? How many of those are vulnerable? Is there anything you can do about it? And is there, and if you haven't ever tried it, have a go at sneak test um, and see what comes up, what you get. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Alexandra. Please do follow her advice when even the American president says you should uh, construct an S-bomb, uh, the, the uh, software bill of material uh, is a presidential executive order. Uh, it's coming here, so please do it. Please follow her advices. Now, before I introduce the next speaker, uh, I'd like to take a moment just to reflect on your one. He is the archetypal kind of open source contributor that you know steps up during his vacation and tends to his code before his children. <laughs> That's tough. But you know, all you need is that drive, the time, and then a problem, and then you go for it. Our next speaker, maybe he's not there quite yet. Uh, Abid is a yes, and give him a hand, please. Uh, Abid is uh, an international programmer from Pakistan uh, uh, via working for South Africa to Sweden uh, and also uh, an Android programmer and so forth. Now, I kind of wanted you to have a shot at uh, talking here and I'm going to juxtaposition you, you know, like the, uh, the, the totally different programmer that works from nine to five. You don't. I just want to say he does code in the evening. But for the sake of this session, imagine how do you do open source at your company? Now, is that a fair description, or am I making too much of an, an you know antithesis of, of you and you on here? Yeah, yes, uh, you can. Uh, you can even work uh, during the uh, working hours and uh, contribute in in the society. Actually, the yeah. So you know, can you make a salary and make a dent in the universe? Yeah, we can. Sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that's basically the session <laughs> yes. here. Please, a bit. Go for Thank it. You. Thank you, thank you. So, yeah. So this is the question, actually. Uh, uh, you do your passion and get paid for that, actually. Uh, as you know, actually, uh, my introduction, so I don't need to do. So, yeah, there are many ways uh, that you can, you can do your passion and get paid for that. Uh, the one of them, actually, it's uh, improve. Uh, as we as we are developer actually we are we are actually using open source project in every time actually uh, so the thing we can improve those libraries is what we are using in the our project and uh, we can even find the bugs and let them know okay uh, we have a bug you can you can fix that one and the other other way actually we we can even suggest suppose we are using some of the li uh, one of the library in our project and there is some kind of improvement or suggestion to to add some kind of new thing to improve that library so we can we can even do that thing uh, during our project uh, uh, working in our project and the third one find the dor find the dormant project and meet uh, and uh, that clients in need and restore to life and this is the thing what I have done actually in, in Soft House. And the last one, start your company and quit 
your job as the hundred. So yeah, um, I have choose uh, I have chosen this one of uh, one of the way. Actually, uh, I found a dormant project and uh, uh, restore to the life. What things you need to do for that? You need to collect the requirement from from the client first. Okay, what they need actually, and then find a lead. Find a lead means find a project that is actually very near to the base of the requirement of, say, of your client actually. So yeah, and then put put a new soul in that project, new implementation, build your own building on the top of the base, and give it to the life to that project. So th this is the thing what I have done actually in we uh, blue term two actually this is the project based on vt100 and it is introduced actually in uh, 1978 it is uh, digital equipment uh, and uh, the application that i have found in its it was built in 2012 and that application blue term two based on this vt100 and it was completely i would say died because uh, there is no work later than 2012 so we we have found a lead. Uh, okay, uh, we need to we need to build a project that based on this VD100. So we uh, I just got up uh, uh, this dormant project, a uh, blue term, uh, that was completely died. So uh, and that project actually it's communicating via Bluetooth serial. So what what, what I need to do for that actually I need to update uh, to fulfill the requirement of the client and uh, deploy to the. Uh, to our client actually. So, what step? Which steps actually I followed from uh, for fulfill the uh, customer needs? Actually, the thing is because it was built in 2012 and it was not supporting to the new Android device. Since it is the uh, Android application, it was actually built in Eclipse 2012. It was not even the Gradle-based project. So, what I have done actually, I have just completely migrated to the you know Eclipse-based project to the Gradle based project. And then uh, in this way actually we uh, we just make that project to work in the new new devices. And then uh, next customer need actually uh, he wants me uh, he wants us to do the P point to point configuration because they have some secure system. So so what uh, what I've done actually I have implemented point to point configuration on that project and uh, give the secure secure system for the client actually. And the third one Third main requirement, actually, because uh, we have a key, we don't have a keyboard in our mobile. We have a keypad. We don't have any kind of escape character and tap character in in our mobile set. So what I've done, actually, I have built some shortcuts for that keys in that video uh, in that uh, blue term project. So, for example, like you you just press a volume up button and press any key that will act like a tap character, or you will press volume down button and press an numeric key that will act like a escape character. So in this way I have solved this problem. So yeah, uh, the final phase actually, the deployment. Once I have done this, all this changing and put a new salt into the project, so it's time to deploy the project on Google Play Store and uh, share that document with the GitHub and give it to the client. So uh, how the things are working with our client side, I would like to invite Edward, and uh, he will explain how he went through with client and how he agreed them to be an open source. Big round of applause. Yeah, hi, I'm Edward, and um, just show a little bit of my background because I've done a lot of different stupid things but uh, I'm, I'm from originate from the technical side but uh, today I mainly work with business development and so on and I'm a consultant manager at soft house today working with a bid and uh, yeah Jens Berush and Bjorn and so on anyway uh, moving the customer from having a request for a feature in uh, some old legacy code and have it taken from the open source community and make it uh, proprietary it didn't feel good <laughs> so I, I wanted to to uh, move the customer from having their needs fulfilled and also 
doing something for the open source community and, and having soft house making a mark there also. I had a firm uh, request from Björn where he is now <laughs> to, to also uh, have something going on for the open source community. So I had a good chat with, with the customer and explained to them, we can do this for you, fulfill your requirements based on this old legacy code and at the same time we can present your name and Softhouse name in the open source community, which will improve your brand, I would say. So uh, I, I made it a business opportunity for them. And, and they jumped for it. So there was a technical request that will moved over to minimal work for getting your ASA, the ASA brand to a wider audience and the open source community. So we wanted to generate brand and staff recognition. I mean, also easier to, to uh, get people to work, to want to work with, with us in our company. And also ASA have easier to, to get people because they have n got to know the, the, these brand names through the open source community. So we made a co-financial co agreement. The main part was paid by the customer to do their thing and Softhouse pitch in a little bit in order to do the open source and we gained both uh, these advantages. And Softhouse company went from the maturity level one, two, three in yeah, short time. So that was my take on this and Thanks. Thank you. Am I going to look? Yeah, uh, I'm hijacking this uh, because actually I'm, I'm putting on the soft house cap here. Now, this was a puzzle, and, and uh, Abid did the code, the project, uh, saw the need. Uh, Edward saw the ability to combine this and make it into business. Now, from my point, in, and I'm in charge of the solution area, we call it like that, it's a competence area, and it's meant to further our ability to do and contribute, uh, both on the uh, sort of open source policy documents to education to this session, actually, which is kind of a, you know, building our brand, uh, I'm being honest here. But I could see all these possibilities sort of like in the puzzle, fitting very nicely together. Now, here's my take. If you work in a corporate development, you are dependent on this. So find your stakeholders, find the people who can bring in something to what you want to do, and then build that puzzle. It's, it's more difficult, uh, but it's doable. It's a different way of doing open source. So um, from the, the, the lone coder uh, fighting it hard out there, getting millions of downloads of code to the person uh, uh, making sure that we have uh, a secure open source. And to the big corporations that, you know, actually turn around and can see it all. I hope we offered you, uh, um, a, you know, a big slice of different perspectives on open source that, that it stands today, really. So thank you, Tibi. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you, Yuan and Abid and Edward. It was great having you here. Thank you all.